Lucy von Lawrence. I'm the Learning Services Manager at Chelmsford Museum. I've been doing the job about seven years and I'm a bit of a local historian. Today I'm going to be talking a bit about Marconi and his early days in Chelmsford through the arrival of um, the New Street Factory and um, what happened in World War II as a result of Marconi being here. So Marconi was born in, in Italy in 1874 uh, with an Irish mother, Italian father. Um, he came to over to England though in 1898 because he did, wasn't getting anywhere in Italy with his experiments on wireless telegraphy, building on the achievements um, of electricity, for example. So he came over and he was looking for somewhere local where he could uh, set up a factory. Now it had to be a bit away from London because he wanted to be close to London but a little bit away because of other developments that were going on. It had to be somewhere flat because in the early days radio signals couldn't get over hills very easily. And it needed to be somewhere not in a busy town centre because in those early days um, the signals were interfering with the radio. He found the perfect place, or to be more accurate, his cousin found the perfect place in Molsham in Hall Street. It was bought on Marconi's behalf and in 1899 the world's first wireless telegraphy company opened in Hall Street in Molsham. At first there wasn't much business and to be fair Marconi didn't even really understand how his invention worked. A lot of the business was winding coils for a new invention of the time called the motor car. In 1912, something major occurred that really changed the game plan. Marconi was due to travel on a ship called the Titanic, but at the last minute he changed his mind and went on the earlier ship. But the Titanic was equipped with a wireless room and two wireless operators, Jack Phillips and Harold Bride, and they sailed off in April 1912 into the Atlantic Ocean for America. As you famously know, the ship never arrived. Many people perished, but those that were saved were saved by the radio operators radioing the CQD, which was the old distress, distress call, and SOS, the new one, uh, right into the night until the power gave out and the captain told them to leave their posts and to try and save themselves. One survived and one died in the Titanic disaster. But after then, every ship wanted distress signals, and so Marconi had to build a new factory, and by June 1912, in just 17 weeks, a new factory in New Street in Chelmsford had been completed and was ready for work. Business was booming for Marconi. His wireless transmitters were in use everywhere, but still people weren't really thinking about wireless the way it's used today for entertainment. The New Street factory had two 450 foot high masts, 133 metres in new money, and these were used to send the signals off because in those early days it still wasn't possible to send signals over high hills. Luckily Essex doesn't have many of those. But in 1920 there was another game changer. Sponsored by the Daily Mail on the 15th of June 1920, the celebrated Australian soprano Dame Nellie Melba came to the New Street factory to give the world's first entertainment broadcast. People didn't really know how this new invention worked very well, so when Dame Nelly arrived, she was being shown to the studio where she was to sing, and she asked the man who was showing her how her voice was going to go out to the nation. Now he allegedly said to her, well madam, your voice will be going out through these 450 foot masts, indicating the large masts, and Dame Nelly looked up at the masts and she looked at him and she said, Young man, if you think I'm going to climb up there, you are greatly mistaken. She was taken through to the studio, having been assured that she really didn't have to climb the masts, and her voice was sent out across the airwaves, the world's first entertainment transmission. Subsequently, a couple of years later, in 1922, from nearby Rittle, Peter Eckersley started broadcasting the first DJ-type transmissions, think Kenny Everett or Chris Evans of his day, uh, from 2 Emma Talk, and this is now preserved in our Sanford Mill site here in Chelmsford. <laughs> Marconi Company 
company continued to develop. Its um, interests included radar, and uh, this was very, very important when World War II broke out in 1939. Indeed, the Marconi factory in New Street was right next door to the Hoffman's factory, which was making ball bearings, little round balls that don't look very exciting, but make your machinery work, which is critical if you've got anything with a moving part from a bicycle through to a bomber jet. This meant that Chelmsford became a target for Nazi bombing in World War II. Uh, the Nazis were so keen to stop what Marconi and Hoffman were doing that they made a special model of Chelmsford. It's a beautiful, beautiful model. But this model has a terrible secret because it was designed so that a bomber could come in and it would actually see the layout of the river, the railway line and the buildings. The buildings looked quite distinctive and could target the, the bombs accurately. And on the 9th of May 1941, they managed a direct hit on the Marconi factory. A single bomber let out four bombs, three of which scored direct hits and uh, caused a fire which was quite quickly put out. Um, several people died in the raids, many were injured, including in Marconi Road, which ran along the side. But the next day it was discovered that one of the bombs had landed but not exploded and because of where it was they had to do a controlled explosion which basically ruined another one of the uh, machine shops. Production was affected for a short while but this being the war everyone bundled together, they organised alternative premises and the factory was up to about 80% production within a very short space of time. Marconi Road, though, wasn't said to be the unluckiest road in Chelmsford. That dubious honour was reserved for Henry Road at the back of Hoffman's, which was bombed more times than any other in the war. After the war, the model made by the Luftwaffe was found in a burnt-out photographic hut in an airfield in Germany and was presented back to Chelmsford, and it's been in the museum ever since.